Cross Ice Pass, episode 26. Um, yes, my voice is still a little hoarse. Um, thank you. Um, I've got a bit of an asthma issue, and we'll see how that rolls out over the next, upcoming weeks. Um, first off, got to start with the big, the big piece of news I have, which I've got a new partnership um, with the Hockey Podcast Network. Um, the Hockey Pod- Podcast Network is sponsored by DraftKings, and this is a big move for Cross Ice Pass um, to be part of a huge network of NHL shows and tons of original content, including shows like Terry O'Reilly's show with TR, Tale to TR, and so many other podcasts. Very excited to be part of this network. And um, it's going to be um, a wonderful thing to see um, how it moves forward. Um, I have to start with the NHL season. Um, season ends on April 18th. And holy crap, is there a battle in the East for the third Metro spot and the last wild card spot between four Metro teams and, of course, my wings. Just as I record this, um, I I would have recorded this earlier, but I got sucked into the Wings losing two to one to the Caps after out shooting them forty four blah blah blah. Um, Flyers got smoked by the Habs, and um, the Isles beat the Rangers. So it's all jumbled around, and it might jumble around um, in the next two days as well. Um, a two point difference is between these teams, and it's going to be crazy what we have up until April eighteenth. Um, Although I think April 18th, that day, is mostly Western Conference teams. But um, don't quote me on that. Um, The teams remaining, Caps, Pens, Isles, Wings, all have four games left. The Flyers have three. Um, Episode 27 will be the last week of the NHL regular season. So um, if I have any hair left by that episode, trying to hope... Um, and will my Red Wings into a playoff contention. Um, you'll see probably physically um, what what that's about. Um, college, all the college hockey levels have come down um, to this. It's the Frozen Four, um, the ACHA, um, a lot of a lot of the no matter what division, um, women's hockey's over. So uh, women's college hockey's over. So. Here we go. March Madness is over, thank goodness, um, because there's only so much you can listen to the word March Madness for three weeks. Um, Super happy. The the women's part of March Madness was probably the most most watch-worthy and great to to keep an eye on. Um, Frozen 4. This episode will be airing just before it starts. Thursday, we have Denver versus Boston University. Denver owns a 17, 15, and 2 all time record against BU and is 3 and 2 in the national tournament. But I still think Boston University is going to win. Um, Michigan is, Michigan got uh, beat my, my uh, MSU team, but I'm still a Michigan kid, so I got a root for Michigan. But Michigan. Um, is playing the number one ranked team in the tourney uh, in Boston College. Um, if Michigan would have been beat by MSU, it would have been the first time that all for all that all number one seeds in each spot would have made the Frozen Four. But of course, the Wolverines made that not happen. Um, Michigan, Boston, and BC. The the Wolverines lead six four on neutral ice and have won four of six. NCAA tournament games with BC, including the 1998 National Championship game at Fleet Center in Boston. Um, Their very first meeting against each other was 1948, which I think is kind of cool. Also in 98, um, when they won that 98 championship, the University of Michigan basketball football team uh, got their 97 title. So since the football team won in 2023, um, just recently, um, we know that, you know, people are talking about can Michigan's hockey team um, do it in 2024. That's not going to happen. It's going to be an all Boston final. BC is going to be winning over BU in the, in the, in the overall um, final game. 
So we'll see if that happens. Again, comment below. Let me know what you think about that, um, whether you agree, disagree, whatever you think. Um, this week's international team, um, we've got one more. We've got next next episode will be Canada because I'm going to fo- want to focus more on the playoffs. So I'm going to get away from international play a little bit. Um, I'm curious, though, this week I had to, um, you know, talk about Russia, even though if they'll be able to play with this terrible war in the Ukraine, will some of the players back out? I don't know. Putin has a lot of um, a lot of grasp on on those players. So. But it would be fu- it's still fun to think about what would this either Russian team or Russian athletics team or whatever we want to t- title it, what would they be? Um, of course, there are, of course, my extra on the forwards is Alexander Ovechkin, but I think Ovechkin will be he'll be about 40 by the time this rolls around, and I don't see him making the Olympic team, but he is kind of the face of Russia. And it wouldn't surprise me if he ends up on the team in some in some way, um, whether that is on the ice or even on the bench. So line one is Nikita Kucherov, of course, having an amazing year um, with uh, Art- Artemi Panarin and Pavel Busnevich. Um, those three together would be sick to see. Um, might not be the most exciting thing to see, but it'll be a pretty fun thing to see. Um, line two's got Kirill, Kirill, um, Kirill the Thrill um, with uh, Vladimir Tarasenko and Evgeny Malkin. Evgeny Malkin will be a little bit less, a little younger than Ovechkin, but I also think that Russia loves him, so I can see him um, finding a way in. Um, Andrei Svechnikov, who just had a, another Michigan goal today. Um, on line three, Valery uh, Nishish, Nishishkin. With uh, Colorado could be awesome. Um, Andre Kuzmenko, that's kind of where I'm at with the Russian forwards. Um, there are some others, but there's also some younger guys that still have to prove themselves. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about a fourth, a fourth line with the forwards. Uh, for defense, um, of course we've got Dmitry Orlov and Mikhail Sergachev, um, who probably will be back for the playoffs. Unbelievably, um, Ivan Provorov. Um, and Dmitry uh, Kulikov are also good on the on the second line. The third line, I think, would be um, Nikita, Nikita Zadorov because I think it'd be nice to have a real like bruising, hard hitting defensive back there, very Russian um, thinking. And this guy Alexander Alexiev from uh, with playing for the Caps, I think he could mold into a really top notch uh, Russian defenseman. The goalies now. The goalies are the easy ones. Um, I mean, just thinking about the top three um, in uh, Vasilevsky, Sorokin, and Shesterkin, I don't know who's going to start out of those three. And then on top of that, Alexander Gorgiev is having an amazing season. And then I could even say, because I could see Russia going after having some older guys for veteran leadership. Um, Bobrovsky hasn't really gone down in his career. So, so that, that's where I am with uh, team Russia or whatever we want to call it. Um, and if it even happens this week's happy, surprising, not surprising and pretty unusual this week, I was able to head out to Meadville, Pennsylvania and play in the second annual BC Memorial tournament um, with the Penn state white team, which you can see, I got the Jersey behind me here. Um, the tournament is in honor of Brandon B.C. Corey, who passed away at the age of 47 um, from a unfortunate um, heart issue. B.C. played for the Meadville Bulldogs, um, won a state championship there, played at Penn State, um, and he's was a true, really close friend to uh, a couple of my friends. Episode 2 um, had uh, Tom Westfall, and he, he really – him – Tom Westfall and his brother Ben are a huge uh, part of this event. Um, so, of course, there's lots of alumni on these teams. Uh, a lot, there was a local police team. There was a Pittsburgh Warriors veteran team came over, So, um, which was great um, because I know that uh, we had Dave, who I, forget, I, couldn't, I couldn't run into 
uh, Dave Jackal from um, one of our prior episodes um, on there to have a soda, but we'll have one in the future, Dave, I promise. Uh, it was truly special few days to honor a great human being. Um, big hugs, handshakes, um, lots of great things when you have such a tight, a tight knit community and um, a really great uh, hockey family. So it was really great to be there and I'm really happy I got to. Um, I was even able to see, um, I, people that don't know me, um, when I have a chance, I like to go see uh, other arenas in the NHL or in any other league for that matter. Um, so I got to see the PPG Paint Arena. Uh, the Lightning made it a hard one for the Pens. The Pens were up for nothing. Lightning came back. Um, and uh, unfortunately, given what I talked about about the playoffs, it was a little hard um, hard thing to take for me, but it was a great game to watch. Um, the, crowds were, the crowd was great. Um, and even though us Red Wings fans sometimes have a hard time with Penguins fans, um, I think that might be because we're more similar than we think. Um, in the game, though, a wild moment of the game, um, I didn't fully see a ton of it because I was going to grab a bite to eat. Um, and I'm like, what is, why is there no hockey on the, on the, on the screen? And it was really quiet. Um, so we kind of looked over and noticed that there was someone that one of the refs was getting put on a stretcher. Um, it was a long time NHL referee, Steve Gazzari left the ice on a stretcher. Um, he was, he, he collided with uh, Tampa Bay lightning defenseman, Hayden Flurry at center ice. Um, from what I hear, because I didn't see the direct impact. Um, it was helmet to helmet contact, and Steve, when it hit him in the when the helmet hit him, um, it probably knocked him out, so he didn't fall very nicely. So that was pretty scary. Um, but sounds like uh, Steve will make a full recovery, and uh, be back to to making um, medium level calls in the near future. Um, on April 6th, the hockey community remembered the Humboldt Bron Broncos crash from six years ago. I hope everyone put out a stick for those players lost. Um, but there is, there was also, in that week, a really great, um, wonderful, lovely, and amazing piece of information. Jacob Wasserman, one of the Humboldt survivors, is qual has qualified for the 2024 Paralympic Games in rowing. So that's pretty amazing. Um, Bravo to the great stories that not only the sad moment that we had in the hockey community with the Humboldt Broncos, but also these great stories that come out of um, some of these, these journey, the journey now that some of these, um, some of the survivors are dealing with. Another, my last happy moment, the Cincinnati Cyclones had a starting five with players of color for the first time ever in the history of hockey. Um, just showing the game's growth for everyone who's real. Um, so awesome to see this. I'm happy it, it caught traction in the news. And it just goes to show um, that hockey is a sport for anybody that's involved. So that was pretty amazing. Surprising. Josh Doan, the son of Shane Doan, had a heck of a welcome game with the Coyotes with two goals while his family watches and with his hometown team. I mean, how cool is that? How perfect of a story is that? So congratulations to Josh Doan um, and his family. And, uh, you know, here's to many more in your, in your, the future of your career. Um, the women's world championships are happening in Utica, New York. And they are awesome. After this episode airs, there's going to be um, elimination rounds of the top eight teams. Um, Japan has advanced to the top eight and will play USA Thursday. Obviously, USA will be the favorite, but we'll have to see. Not surprising. Bill Guerin gave his first quote as GM of USA hockey team. Um, I want to see commitment. And if a trip to the Caribbean is more than the world championships, then you're not really committed. And this is Garen putting a finger, pointing a finger directly at 
some USA players that have skipped the world championships in the past. Um, you know, Red Wings right now are loaded with a, a, a bunch of USA players that might, you know, if the Red Wings don't make the playoffs, hopefully they'll be at the world championships. And that, and I'm ta- looking at you, Alex DeBrincat and Dylan Larkin. So um, I think Dylan Larkin missed last year because he was injured, but not sure. Um, also not surprising. And this is another thing I waited for to, to do this episode with. Joe Quenville finally opened his mouth about what happened with the Blackhawks on the, on the Cam and Strick podcast. He was smart to be clear how it wasn't directly in his knowledge, but he also apologizes that he didn't know sooner and he wishes that he would have done something sooner. It sounds like he's not happy with, with the way he acted. And that was, that was um, genuine in his interview. Of course, he is hoping to get back on an NHL bench. So he seems, so he needed to talk about this. Unusual. The Newfoundland Growlers ceased operation immediately within the season still happening. I'm not sure what this is all about. Um, I know Terry Riley um, got got to play for them, but um, I'm hoping that, you know, small town teams are needed. The, the fanship is so much greater, and um, hearing things about this is a little sad. At least they couldn't, you know, so they, I would hope they could have at least finished their season. Um, Jeff Skinner celebrated his thousandth game, but they're all regular season games. He has never played in the playoffs. And I never thought that was wild to me. What a crazy uh, way to have a career to, that means, you know, 84 games, 84 games, 84 games. Um, Pretty amazing. And Jeff Skinner was injured for a while. So to get a thousand games out of that without any playoff, uh, um, numbers is pretty wild. I loved the pause in the game um, between the Sens and the Caps because the sun was right in the face of, of the goaltender, Corpusalo. If you saw the visual of this, it's wild. The sun is directly in his face. Um, this is what happens when we get into the sun, when we get into the spring, and we're having a day game. Um, probably hit some shiny object. And uh, and that was that. We know hockey games move fast, but with uh, with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting park partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can get five bucks and get two hundred instantly in in both in bonus bets. So check it out. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code THPN. Um, new customers bet just five bucks on the NHL and get 200 instantly in, in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings po- uh, Sportsbook with code THPN. Um, the crown is yours. And um, there you go. Today's interview. Today's guest is known as one of the largest hockey fighters in hockey. When he was playing, he was close to 500 pounds. He's six seven. He is a massive human being. Nowadays, he is a much thinner, um, in shape and healthy individual. But back when he played, he was a big guy. Um, but my biggest thing about him being the largest player, I think it's because his heart is so massive, and he truly is a loved teammate by everyone he who he is connected to. Um, at this tournament this weekend, I was at had some guys that played in Danbury. A few guys played in other minor league teams, and they know who he know that who he was. <clears throat> so they're very excited about my chat with Teddy. Um, it goes through everything from guys he trained um, with, the guys he fought, and how being a great hometown guy gives him um, a long rolodex of hockey people that he stays connected to with, and talks to them every Wednesday to make sure that they're doing okay. And that, um, you know, what what they're up to. Um, so, on that note, I think it's time we move to this chat with Teddy. So, we've got a D-man born in Hoppington, uh, Mass. Former volunteer firefighter with 30 years of service. A big man fighter for many years in the LNAH, um, UHL, ECHL, amongst other teams that needed some extra hands. Um, assistant coach for Anaheim Ducks, 
um, GM of the Danbury Mad Hatters, VP and Director of Hockey Operations for SRZ Sports, um, became a nurse at the Norfolk Prison at the start of his career in medicine, was voted into the select board in his hometown of Hobbington, Mass., where he served six years, um, currently Clinical Director of Operations at Marianne Morris Corporation, a true hometown guy who loves helping others, a proud father and husband. Welcome to Cross Ice Pass, Brendan Teddy Tedstone. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, of course. No, um, one thing we always start with, Teddy, is um, kind of become my go-to, which is know, knowing what your fondest hockey memory is, whether it's something when you're a kid, something more recent. Um, it can be anything that comes to mind. Yeah, there's a few, man. Like, um, I would say... Obviously, the first time you ever sign your your like when you sign your first hockey contract, that's pro contract. That's a huge deal. Um, uh, I'd like to say you know my first goal is a big deal, but uh, that has yet to happen. Uh, I've not yet gotten a goal. First fight was a pretty good one, um, and then um, I will say that uh, you know after I stopped playing. I was called by um, by the old F, I think it's the FPHL Federal Professional Hockey League, and um, they asked if uh, so. The team in Delaware had folded, but Danbury, um, I had been the general manager in Danbury, and then I had kind of walked away from the game. So a couple of years later, <clears throat> that team had folded in in Delaware, but Danbury has such a big crowd; they lose money if they you know they had already. They had already uh, paid for the rink, so they wanted to have the game regardless. So the league called and asked if I could uh, put a team together. Uh, and it was against uh, uh, a longtime foe of mine, uh, Phil Esposito. Um, not the one from the Bruins, the, the other one. And um, <laughs> so we determined what a budget would be. Um, I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll throw a team together, me and uh, RJ Gates. Um, so Gatesy and I put our heads together and, um, uh, first signing was, uh, a, a really, really like a 30 year good friend of mine named Jason Michelson, whose nickname is the goon, uh, the goon, when I was the general manager for Danbury, uh, I had signed him for a couple of game contracts and he wound up leaping into the bench and beating up Esposito when he was coaching, I think Hudson Valley. So he, he got a lifetime suspension from the federal league. Um, so he was my first sign. And then the league said, no, they're not going to allow him to play, even though it was a different league. So I said, then, uh, then we're not going to be like, you can't, you can't ask me to put a team on there and then, you know, give me some financial parameters and, and then start picking and choosing who I can and can't take. So I'm like, then I just won't do it. So Herm got involved with it and uh, wound up turning it around. And so I got him. I had a couple of American League guys. I had a kid named Danny Farrell, whose lifetime dream was to play a hockey game. He had coached, uh, I think, the Berkshire team in that league a year, year or two prior. Um, and uh, he was a big hockey. He developed, like, safety equipment, shoulder pads, elbow pads, things like that. Um, so we made his dream come true by signing him. He actually got an assist on one of the games, on one of the goals. <clears throat> uh, going into the third period, we were down, I want to say we were down like three to one or five to two, something like that. And uh, I went into the locker room. I was the coach and uh, I just lost it through trash barrels, slam doors. Um, anybody that's watched that Danbury documentary, uh, their equipment manager was T-Bone. So I had brought T-Bone in and his son, Cody, uh, as our equipment guys. <clears throat> and uh, I lost it, whipped, my, whipped the trash barrels around, grabbed some guys, threw them around, said, you know, I fought this guy a bunch of times and I've never even, I don't even remember him even touching me in a fight. I'm not losing a game to this guy tonight. And then the goon, when I left, I slammed the door. The goon stood up, had his say with the guys. Uh, they came out and, um, 
I think the goon wound up getting the game winning goal. Eventually it was the game winning goal. We wound up winning and he picked up the puck and skated by and whipped it at Esposito. <laughs> uh, so uh, it really was, it, it was like our miracle on ice, a bunch of knucklehead ragtag donkeys. And, and so I think we wound up winning like eight to five or eight to six, something like that. And our goalie made about 1 million saves. And uh, to this day, <laughs> that was one of my, uh, that's one of my favorite hockey memories is, is uh, getting that section 102, who I was friendly with to begin with, because I played against Danbury and then, um, and then when I was the when I was in the United League with Flint and Richmond and Elmira, and then uh, when I uh, when I retired, I took over the team. So I was the general manager there. So I was very in with those guys. So, but we turned that whole section one hundred two. They were cheering for us and ripping Esposito and, and those guys. So uh, that was a pretty that was a pretty fun hockey memory. It's a pretty good way to get back at a guy a bit. <laughs> yep, is to have. Yep. Uh, you know, have have bring a little bring a little crazy against a little crazy. That's always good in the in, yep. the, in the hockey world. Yep. Um, it's 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 funny because every time uh, you know, and I, and uh, our buddy Tom who connected us, he always brings me guys that somebody has touched the Flynn Generals and and uh, growing up in Michigan, my family couldn't afford really going to Red Wings games all the time, so we went to a lot of a lot of Generals games. Yep. So, and it was just about the time you were, you were playing there as well. I don't know if I, I don't recall ever uh, connecting and seeing you play, but um, I did find some videos um, of you fighting with the generals. So um, how'd that happen? That was worth it. <laughs> um, one thing I, yeah, one thing, one thing I want to kind of start with, I definitely usually like to go chron uh, chronologically. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, smooth, our conversation. But I'm kind of curious, you know, let's start with what started you in playing hockey when you were a kid. Um, I heard I've heard so many things about you about when I researched you that, you know, um, the neighborhood kids were pretty active when you guys were younger. But kind of curious uh, where hockey came into play there. Yeah, so I grew up in a really small town, Hopkinton, Mass. Is, uh, I mean, it's a it's a it's growing now exponentially, but. Uh, growing up, there were only like five, 6,000 people in the town, and the ponds would freeze. Uh, well, I was just talking about this with, with a buddy of mine. Is I can remember like around Thanksgiving time is when the ponds would freeze, and we could get out there and start skating. Um, and there were two ponds right by my house, and we would skate on one in the morning, and then we'd have lunch, and then we'd skate through the river. Uh, you know, hopefully the river was frozen, so you'd skate on the river over to the other one. So <clears throat> while we were skating on the other one, the fire department would come down and blow off the, the pond and then flood it. So the next morning we were good to go on that. And then in the, in the morning, they'd come and do the same thing to the one that we hit the afternoon. So um, I lived in a, uh, I lived in a, a, in a neighborhood where we're, we're still all very, very close, but I was three, four, five, six, seven, eight years younger than the, the guys that were skating there. And I was not a very good hockey player, but I loved it. <clears throat> so uh, I never played a second of organized hockey until my freshman year in high school. And that was a very short lived uh, tryout for a hockey factory here and uh, out this way called St. John's. Um, <clears throat> I got cut in about three minutes and uh, I went to the coach afterwards and said, <clears throat> what do I got to do to make your team next year? And he's like, so what was your name? So I told him, he looked at his clipboard and said, you know, uh, you'll never play on any team that I ever coach. You're just, you're not a, you're not a hockey player. Uh, and then I left the school. So I, I didn't like the school. Wow. Uh, I didn't leave it because I couldn't play hockey. I left it because I, I think I fought someone in the lunchroom. It was a Catholic school and all boys and it wasn't just, wasn't my jam. So I went to a tech school in, uh, in Framingham, a couple towns over and played hockey there for two or three years and loved it. And um, again, wasn't very good. <clears throat> Um, but we were, uh, you know, I, I love the game. So, uh, and then I started playing men's leagues and again, not very good, but it had a certain niche that I filled and, um, you know, got noticed from here and there. I, I, I was able to, I tried out and made a team in high school. It was called Team USA. 
and um, we went over to Switzerland. So I was over in Switzerland, 87, 88, and then I played over there in 89 as well. Um, and that was that was a lot of fun over there. But the rinks are big, it's fast. They didn't really want fighters. So um, that's when I came back. I landed that job with Anaheim, and then I was offered that job up in Quebec and played a lot of like a lot of uh, like minors that were not really accredited, like knucklehead league. So when you look up my numbers on like Hockey DB, it just shows that I had like not not that many games. But these other leagues that I played in, they were brutal, um, but and they were fun. So. Uh, so that's how I got started, and and uh, yeah, and I don't know how. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty great. I mean, because it actually kind of you you led me right back right into the the question I was going to ask because, um, not only the for the Ducks in Quebec, but you had a bit of a gap from you know when you were a teenager to when you started actually playing playing pro hockey, and. I thought that was interesting that there was this, that there was this little gap of time there that uh, somehow they found um, a bit of a team started teams that needed a fighter um, somehow found your number. Yeah, so um, I got in a car wreck and where I broke my right femur, so I really wasn't able to play for a, a, a bit, um, and then when I got back into it. Uh, I was really good friends with a guy that used to play for the Bruins. His name's Lyndon Byers. So LB and I were were really good friends. He put me onto some of the connections with his guys and um, kind of kickstarted my pro career again. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there was a guy named Wayne Veery, um, who you know of, of all the guys that I that I work for in pro hockey. Uh, Wayne and Robbie Nichols are two of the most uh, honest guys that you'll that you'll come across. Like if they said they're going to pay you a thousand bucks in cash, they give you your thousand bucks in cash. Uh, they were all very very honest. Wayne brought me up to the LNAH in Sherbrooke, where it was me, Roger Maxwell, Louis Bedard, and uh, this nut job named Tim Lebeck, um, who, if you've watched that movie, The Chiefs, uh, he was the he was the nut job, and that wasn't an acting job. He was nuttier than a fruitcake. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Wayne made his promises to me. He was very forthright, honest, got me everything that he was supposed to get. Uh, just didn't work out there. So that's when I went over to St. Hyacinth and I played in Sorrel and I think up in John Kier a little bit too. So, um, so yeah, the, you know, it, the, the niche of a fighter, um, I think the, the one up that I had, my talent was awful. Uh, and it wasn't awful because of my car accident or because of my broken leg. It was just awful because I was awful, but I loved it. Um, but the thing with the, I, I think some of the things that hold some of the fighters back is they think that they're hockey players. Uh, I didn't have any, and some of them are. I don't mean to say that some of them aren't, um, but uh, I was not. And I knew that if I was going to get a paycheck, it was strictly to fight. Um, I can remember when I was in Richmond, one of my first morning skates, I didn't usually do morning skates, but Robbie Nichols had brought me from Flint to Michigan, I mean, to Richmond, wanted me to do a, a, a morning skate, like second drill, full speed. I was, I was coming up the middle, looking for a pass. Uh, our captain was Brian Gowdy. He was coming the other way. I ran into him and I was 500 pounds then too. So <clears throat> I wasn't moving. So he got Bullsh I mean, he got angry at me and and uh and we almost kind of went at it uh in our morning skate my first day there um but we've become very very good friends but Robbie used to like <clears throat> when I do these morning skates he'd like he's like Teddy uh why don't you go check your skates make sure they're nice and tight because we'd be doing these backward skating drills which I stunk at so I would go off, they'd do their drills, and then I'd come back and say, yeah, skates are all set, coach, I'm ready to roll. So uh, but Robbie got it, Wayne Beery got it. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was there to make sure that my guys were safe, and, and I, took, I took that job very, very serious. But I was, I mean, let's face it, I was 500 pounds. So let's, uh, let's not call a, let's call a spade a spade. I was there to be a meathead, and uh, I wasn't there. I didn't get a lot of power play time, so. <laughs>
there's um there's a lot of there's a lot of videos of your fights and things like that if if uh people dig dig through hockeyfights.com all the all the other spots um but yeah from things that things i researched and known you were known as the biggest pro player back then and i can't even imagine trying to to deal with that um in a fight so um you definitely had the right the right acumen for it yep yeah and the mindset too you know and <laughs> i worked out with a guy named doug smith and smitty was uh he wrote that book goon and which turned into a movie called goon still very very good friends with him i think the world of him uh but we used to go down to the there was a, a, a rink down in hingham which is where on thursday nights that was a it was called the top gun league and it's where all the pros played you had to be a pro to play in that um I did not play in that league. Um, that was a that was a good fast league. Like Brendan Shanahan played in it. Uh, there were a lot of really really good hockey players there. Um, uh, I did try to fight Shanahan one day because he married Kathy Janney, Craig Janney, who used to play for the Bruins, was a good friend of mine. And uh, Shanny, when they were on a road trip, became friendly with with uh, Craig's wife and. They, Craig and, and Kathy got divorced and now Brendan's married to her, but it doesn't make it right. Like to me, I was just, I wanted yeah. to kill the guy because you don't do that to your teammates. But, um, so yeah, I used to work with Smitty like, uh, three times a week and in, in that little mini rink in Hingham and just work on my fighting. And, and, uh, I had a blast, uh, and made some really, really good friends. Like Brian Boyle was a guy that we worked out with. Colt Noor was a guy that we worked out with. Um, and then DJ King is another guy that played for Worcester uh, and St. Louis in the in the hockey in NHL. Uh, so we worked out with a whole group of like six or seven guys, and uh, Steve uh, McIntyre, another one. Uh, all these guys that you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh Jesus, these guys are legit. Like, look at these guys skate backwards; they're wicked good. Uh, <laughs> here I am tightening my skates as a, a session, but. Yeah, so I all I wanted to do was fight, you know, and I knew that uh, that was the only way I was going to get my uh, get a paycheck or uh, or, you know, the paycheck was I normally just took my paycheck and gave it back. I gave it to the captain or to the coach and said, you know, for road games, make sure that these guys are all set with beer or food or whatever. I I had a job, you know, for me, it was the, the money wasn't uh, wasn't what I was there for. It was for the for the teammates and the camaraderie. So um yeah get a, so, yeah, get a couple was, nice uh, jerseys get a few good meals yeah so my jerseys I, a, I sold a lot of my jerseys and that's what kept me going through nursing school i didn't work so you know there was a, a website called like drop your gloves or something like that and these people paid so much money for these game worn jerseys for meatheads and uh you know every every month i would i would uh sell a jersey and uh you know, get 12, 1500 bucks, 1800 bucks. Um, and, uh, tell that's, my wife, I got three. That's impressive. Bucks for it and, yeah. Yeah. I kind of a cult <laughs> following, you know, like I really, I really was a sideshow. Um, but I had a pretty good cult following. Uh, I know like when I signed up for Facebook, I was still playing. And then all of a sudden I'm at 5,000 people. Uh, they said, you can't take anymore. I'm like, well, I got family members. I want to, you know, and real friends. So I had to go through and kind of call the list right. of uh, friend, friends versus fans. It's funny to think that back in those, because there it's it's true, back in those days there were those kind of limitations to social media. And now it's, you know, six figures, seven figures, people following you. Yeah. Which you know, I always, I always, I still always think it's funny in Instagram that uh, they have people follow you. Which, well, yeah. I, I don't know about you. Teddy, but when I grew up, like you didn't want people to follow you. That was usually a bad thing. Oh, <laughs> so. right, <laughs> right. Um, and I don't even do one I don't question. Think I have a Twitter account. I think I have a Twitter account. Um, I know I do because things come up, but I've never posted anything on it. I don't know how to use it very well. I use Facebook, and my wife uses. Uh, she has uh, Instagram and what's the other one? TikTok, just to kind of keep an eye on my kids. So I got a. 15 year old daughter and a 13 year old son. So we got to keep an eye on them. Yeah. You got to keep an eye, a big eye on them then. Yeah. Yep. Um, one thing I was curious about, um, cause I thought it was funny cause Westy told me that you were a fighting coach for the ducks 
mm-hmm. from what I researched you when I researched said you were assistant coach of the Ducks. I have a feeling I wanted to talk a little bit about that time when you were uh when you were helping out those uh NHL teams and yeah. Kind of some of the because you already had mentioned some of the people you were you were you were training with and working with. Um, what was that? What was that role like? Can, uh, you know, unlike when you were um, playing. Yeah, so that was actually really cool. So, not I don't I don't like to mislead people. I wasn't when you say an assistant coach. I wasn't like an assistant coach on the bench. I was up in the press box, kind of monitoring where the shots came from and running it down between periods. So. I guess my title would be more like an associate coach than an assistant coach, but it was great. Like, uh, made some really, really great friends there, um, and was able to kind of hone my own skills while I was working it with, with these guys. But I had like Stu Grimson, uh, Stu was a guy that, that I worked with a little bit. Uh, but more so I worked, I, I did the learn to skate with, uh, my buddy Hutchie who runs that whole program out there that, that runs the whole practice rink for the ducks. And uh, so Stu's son, Noah, uh, I taught how to skate, which I don't know, shame on Stu for letting him, you know, having me teach your son how to skate is probably the equivalent of hiring me as a, as your dietitian. Like, it's just probably not a, <laughs> didn't, I didn't do a lot of edge work with my skates, but kid was only like five, a wonderful kid. And Stu was a great guy. And Sean Antosky was another, and, and is still, I still consider him a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, Garrett Burnett was there, uh, and then of course Bernie came up to the to the LNAH uh, and the United League. Um, but yeah, there were a, a lot of Steve Ruchin was a really good friend. Timu uh, Solani and I, you know, we hit it off really really well. Um, <clears throat> matter of fact, he was at, he was at a golf tournament out in St. Louis, I think, a year or two ago, and I got a, friend, a call from a buddy of mine who was a, a sports sporting goods salesman here. He's like, I'm in this charity turn golf tournament. And I don't know how, but your name came up. And, uh, so, so he and Timo were on a call and, uh, Craig Milhouse is the team physician or was up until a year or two ago. Uh, again, just lifelong friends. I, 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 I've been very fortunate in my, uh, I think the reason I, that I was, that I've been so fortunate to maintain such strong friendships is, I didn't carry my job off the ice. A um, couple times I carried it up into the bleachers, but uh, I didn't carry it off the ice. And I've not ever been in a bar fight. I've not been in a fight outside of like junior high school. Um, and uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty easygoing guy, and I always have been. I always fought with a smile on my face, and win or lose, as long as you didn't kind of break. You know, they talk about the code. Uh, people have used that term, the code. Um, you know, there's there's three reasons why you fight in a, in a game. There's, you know, you're looking out for your guys is the number one. The second is to maybe change the momentum a little bit. If we're getting beat or they come back, you know, we're up and they score two quick goals and I'll go out and do my thing. Uh, and those are all generally benign fights. You know, I'm not looking to knock you guys, knock your head off your shoulders. But there were a couple of guys that... Uh, I really didn't like that, uh, you know, when you fight, it, it was something that they either did to you or said about you or whatever. And uh, then you, you you throw a few more RPMs in your in your wing to to put these guys <laughs> to bed. Yeah, that's uh, that's all it takes. Just a little. Uh, yep. uh, just a, just a, just a, just to some, put a little bit more uh, gasoline to the fire. It's always a good. The thing in those yeah, situations. Robbie, Robbie Nichols. Yeah, used no, to say it's to me, um, it's interesting because okay. yeah. Uh, Robbie used to say to me, he's like Teddy, you got to put more jam in your game. I go in my game. He go well in your fights. You just got to get a little bit more angry, like less smiling, more sneering. I'm like ah, I like doing what I do. I have a fun time doing it. <laughs> I think <clears throat> Teddy, I got to tell you, if I ever had to match up with a guy your size and you're smiling i think that that would probably be the more terrifying moment than if you weren't (laughs) because because if you're smiling that's that's a bit of a scary thing to walk right up to you know so (laughs) yeah we had a guy so i I used to go up way up north to uh northern quebec there was a guy named serge roberge and i would go and work out with him uh in the summers and uh he would just say, you know, Teddy, you're so big. 
All you have to do is grab on and let these guys try to move you around and you'll be able to see them like they're red, 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 red. And then finally, it's like a cartoon. You know, once it got to here, then it was time to, to you know, go ahead and tire yourself out trying to move me around. I'm 500 pounds. You're not pushing me anywhere. And then, um, <laughs> and then, and that's eventually what I did. But, but it was a, you know, when I first started fighting, it was just fight to fight. You know, like, I don't care. You punch me in the face. I'm going to punch you in the face. But then as I got older, I realized how much that hurts. So I became, I guess you'd say a technical, like not technical, like Serge or like Jason Hamilton. Those guys were really like technical. Dennis Bonby is another guy, very technical. Uh, I was more defensive because uh, I hated getting punched in the face eventually. Uh, but not so defensive that I was like Donald Brashear. You know, that was, uh, you know, they call him Huggy Bear. And it's it's because all he wants to do is hug you until you're tired and then throw a couple of pillows and not hurt you, but make it look like he won the fight. So, <clears throat> Well, and I hear in the year, um, I heard uh, that in the year of the lockout, you got to fight against Brashear, right? Yeah, he was up in our league. Uh, I did go out. Tried to get him to go, <clears throat> and uh, he said a few angry things to me uh, about my appearance. And I just I looked at him and I'm like, Are "You calling me a fat shit or like whatever you're saying?" I said, "I didn't think that we should get into personal stuff." I go, "You're a black guy playing hockey. If you want to get personal about it, I can get personal about it." So he wouldn't fight me. So my guy Kenny Tasker came up and took it. And unfortunately, Brash just put the screws to task pretty, pretty strong. But, uh, you know, I, I just thought that was that spoke vol volumes of his character. I've never, ever, ever, ever turned down a fight. I don't care if you're Mike Barhog, who's seven feet tall, or if you're <clears throat> Drew Omicelli, who's five feet tall. If you want to fight me, I'll fight you. I, I'll never say no. Um, um, but uh, he, especially up in that league, like your whole envelope at the end of the end of the week was predicated on how many fights you got in and how you did so um you know by him turning me down i lost a significant amount of money um but <laughs> yeah so hearing that story what was what's uh before we move into your post hockey career because a lot of your post hockey career kind of has some of the some of these like cocky connections but yep. i'm curious to know what was your what were your like most memorable fights? <clears throat> well, obviously the the one that I couldn't get scrubbed off the internet is the uh, Big Snake fight. Um, Robin's a good guy. I still speak to him on occasions. Um, he ran into a little bit of trouble after he stopped playing, but Robin was a really good guy, and uh, <clears throat> we talked in warm ups a little bit that game. I, I said it was. I think it was a home and home. No, that was a different, that was Jeff Walton. Um, so <clears throat> we were in, I think we were in Rockford and I tried to get him go a bunch of times. And, and he's like, listen, I don't want to say no to you, but Marty Martinson uh, said, I can't fight you. He goes, I'm too valuable as a hockey player and you're awful. <laughs> and I said, well, I get it, but it's eight to two. So <clears throat> um, he's like, no, I'll, I'll get fined. I said, okay, you're fine. I don't care. Like, I, you know, I flew out to Rockford to, you know, the nice thing about Rockford, th those fans were insane, but they didn't really hate me. They liked to rag on me a little bit. <clears throat> so there was one time that I went out for a shootout. We were tied. Um, so Robbie's like, go out and pretend you're going to take the first shot in the shootout. <laughs> so I went out and I, w I had no intention of taking the shootout. <clears throat> I probably missed the net for, you know, to be honest. Uh, but somebody whipped a Kit Kat at me. Um, so I stopped, I was circling the puck. I stopped, dropped my glove, picked up the Kit Kat and ate it and then went back to the bench and they did the shootout. Uh, so the Rockford fans, and then I did a couple of radio shows in Rockford. Um, so eventually, you know, I, I don't want to say what I said to get Robin to go. And I don't, I'm sorry. If, I don't know how much he got fined for fighting me. And it was a garbage fight. My my skates, I, I just, it was a garbage fight. I was, it was halfway through the third period. I hadn't gotten off the bench. Everything was cramped. I used to take so many ephedra pills to turn me into the Hulk. 
Um, all my legs were cramping up and I just had no balance and, and it was an awful fight. But um, <clears throat> we always, anytime I'll, I'll send him a text, Robin or, or Robin sends me, I'd be like, Hey buddy, it's uh, it's the guy who made you famous. And then he'll say the same thing. Hey, it's the, it's the Indian that made you famous. Um, <clears throat> but I'd say that was my most well-known fight. Uh, I fought Jason Clark a few times in a game up in the Quebec league. He was in Verdun. Uh, Verdun was a, uh, they were loaded. They had uh, Mike Henderson. They had Mike Barhog. They had uh, Clarkey. I think they had Pat Cote. I think they had Pat Cote as well. Um, and then uh, like Mike Bajerni, uh, that, uh Mike Tobin was there, who turned out to be one of my teammates in Flint. Um, so it was, uh, I fought Clarkey a couple of times. Again, I didn't do too good in those fights either, but. Um, it is what it is. When you go out in the third period after sitting for 55 minutes, uh, becoming dehydrated because you have so much caffeine and Red Bull and ephedra pills running through your body, uh, <clears throat> you can't expect too much. But um, yeah, <laughs> I can only ma I can only imagine sitting for that for that long, just ready, just ready to open the door, and and, and then oh, and then you're like, you man, know, all right, let's stretch out I, a little bit. I either made or lost so much money, so. Whoever I was sitting with, we would always bet a buck a song to see who could guess the, the song that came on the Jumbotron or, you know, like on breaks. And Billy <laughs> Vandermeer and I used to go back and forth. Curtis Tidball and I went back and forth, too. And um, it was, uh, you know, you might lose 30 bucks or win 30 bucks, depending who you're sitting next to. But uh, that was always my uh, I was always good at the at the music trivia, probably better than at the fighting. But um, it was pretty, pretty fun way to uh to kind of go through the through go through the game yeah for sure um getting to to research you know your career and and i mean kind of had this interestingly wholesome and you know and love to to be a big fighter with helping all types of people but the thing that i love um there was a there was this video that i found um, meet your neighbor interviewer in 2016. Um, and you said one thing that I, that I really loved. And you said you went from putting guys in the hospital to getting them out. Um, yeah. how does, uh, being that fighter help you as a caregiver? Well, I don't know how being a fighter helps me as a caregiver. It, it did help me. My first job was, uh, I was the trauma director at the maximum security prison in, in Massachusetts. So you know, because I had done a lot of uh, EMS stuff with the fire department, it was just kind of a natural progression. And, and then with my hockey background. Um, so, you know, I always like everything. So like, like I said, on the fire department, <clears throat> when you're 14, 15 years old, and you're out working on the at a brush fire or a house fire, or whatever, <clears throat> you understand kind of the paramilitary way where, you know, if I have a problem with you, I'm not going to go to the chief and say, I have a problem with you. I'm going to, and this is at age 14 where you had to figure it out real quick. Um, you know, you go to, you, you talk to the guy and if there's a problem with that, then you go to the Lieutenant and then to the captain and then to the deputy. If you get to the chief, um, there should be pretty something significantly uh, wrong. Um, and then it's the same thing with hockey is <clears throat> team environment. My guys were safe. I was always the first guy on the ice. I was always the last guy off the ice. Um, and there were a lot of shenanigans, whether they were all for fun or for serious, um, you know, my job was first and foremost to make sure that my guys are safe. Um, and I did that, you know, I, I brought that mentality along as a nurse at the prison, uh, where there, I don't know if I'm past the statute of limitations on a few things that I can't talk about right now, but, um, and then I wound up realizing that. You know, I was using more of my hockey experience working in the prison than I was my nursing experience. So I left. I went to the geriatric world <clears throat> where all I am is nice to these people all day long. And it's it's uh, it's pretty cool. Like when you think about it, I'm a huge fan and supporter of our military. Um, and for me to get paid to go sit in a dementia unit at lunchtime and have lunch with this guy who was a, and I'll use a real, real example. Uh, <clears throat> this guy was a code breaker in world war two. 
um, and he had dementia. Um, and I would get paid to sit there and, and talk with him and to just kind of pick his brain. Although he couldn't have told you what he had for lunch that day, he remembered very vividly from Little League, you know, growing up to being in, in you know, the Navajo code breaker. It's just, it really is a, it's an awesome, uh, it's an awesome field to be in. Um, and I guess by, by having to have such a thick skin at, at away games, um, it gets you ready for the, for the patients that aren't happy or are sick or the family members or whatever, it gets you ready to, to kind of be well-versed in there. And I've done relatively well in this career. I, I started as a weekend nurse in the geriatric community and went to a supervisor, to a director. Now I'm the clinical director of operations for this company that I've been with, uh, for about 14 years. So, um, it's, it's awesome. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's by far one of the most rewarding jobs that I've ever had. Um, and my, and despite my persona for hockey, I've always been like, I try to be a, a stand up guy. And now that I have kids, um, you know, and my kids are at a very impressionable age now. Um, I try to kind of make sure that they know whether it's baseball, softball, basketball, whatever. Fortunately, they don't play hockey, which is great by me. Um, but, you know, you make it so it's, I, I would tell them, I'm like, you know, Robbie Nichols couldn't cut me. He, he couldn't do it because if I was a healthy scratch, I'd go wash his car. I'd go sign autographs. I'd run out and get pizzas. Like it, I would do whatever it, it took to stay on the team. And I'd tell the kids, that's what you have to do. Like if, if you want to be part of something, you don't have to be the best player. You just have to be the right one. No, that's, that's so good. And, and like what, what you just unloaded so many things that are so great. I mean, the kids I coach, I, I always re recommend, you know, cause I think, I think there's this like fear of in kids. now I, I, I think every kid kind of has that when you're around someone that's old, that's older, um, you know, a senior citizen or, or things like that. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, man, you would not understand. You, you will not, you'll never say no again. Once you start to dig into these stories that these folks have and, you know, the things that they went through in history. Yeah. And um, I think, I think it's so good to, to, to spend time with them, um, to spend time with them, even, you know, near the kind of the, the, the closure of, of their story, you know, just making sure that, that they have some ears there for them. That's important. And then having kids that, you know, trying to, you know, it's, it's, Teddy, it seems like you're probably, probably an, an A plus dad when it comes to making sure your kids aren't, uh, I'm pretty sure your kids are probably well mannered considering you're a firefighter, considering you have a, um, a love for the military <laughs> and, um, you know, you're, you're not even, even that, like as a fighter, you seem like you're a nice guy. You are like, you know what, let's go. But, uh, yeah. You you know it's kind of a a, a good mixture. Um, the one thing that I'm curious about out out of all of that is as a caregiver. Um, recently, the world has finally found the importance of mental health um, through healthy living. Um, I know you you fought with a lot of guys that um, probably avoided any of the, um, the the situations that have happened happening in from fighters. Um, like, you know, Derek Bugard and Chris Simon, we lost them because of some of these problems. Um, but I'm kind of like curious your thoughts on on the mental health aspect of fighting and hopefully, you know, it's it's going the right direction, but I don't know if it's there yet. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was actually part of a group and I don't want to say any names, but I was part of a group with a, a lot of really prominent NHL fighters, some minor league fighters, uh, some some great great people, and there was a, a guy who was a and and I'll say his name. His name is Chucky Thuss, T H U S S. Probably <clears throat> probably the best person you'll ever meet in your life. Um, minor league goalie for a long time, very ingrained in, in the hockey world very well respected. <clears throat> and I was invited by him to, to start this group uh, of, of guys that were that kind of did our job uh, much better than I did, and much more frequently than I did. Um, 
and we'd, we'd sit around and talk and, and, you know, maybe the first little bit was you'd talk about one of these guys might have had a problem where maybe he's got some substance abuse, maybe some mental health issues, maybe some just some depression, uh, because it's a huge deal <clears throat> to leave like the amount of, of fans and admiration, whether it's fake or real, <clears throat> you become very accustomed to wherever you go, people coming up and shaking your hand or hugging you or signing your Pac-Man lock lunchbox or taking pictures and and then it's gone. And once it's gone, like you walk down the street and you're like, why aren't people coming out? You know, just because I'm not fighting now, I'm still the same person. And some people are are more geared mentally to handle that. Uh, some people are more are geared uh, better socially to handle that. They have a great support system. Uh, and some are not. And then like you look at Brandon Christian uh, is another guy that that he was in my my league up there. His brother's like just a great guy, good friend of mine as well. Uh, Brendan had some mental health issues. Um, Ryan Pesiak was another guy that I fought. Uh, tough, tough guy. And then when he left, when he stopped doing hockey, he got big into religion. And then I heard, you know, a year or so ago, maybe two, that, that he had taken his life. Um, that group that, that I was part of for a while, for a long while, um, those Wednesday night calls, it really was, it was awesome. And, and I started out being the person that was, you know, kind of listening and, and, and not needing, not needing it. But then, you know, as you, as you get ingrained and you become more comfortable and realize that all these guys that are on the call with you are pouring their heart and soul out too, with some of their, their issues, you do the same. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> So, you know, Chucky Thus did such an awesome, awesome job. And I'm, I'm proud to, I'm proud of the work that he did. And I'm, I'm proud to call him a great, great friend. Uh, and I still, anytime I come across somebody that might, that I feel that might benefit from something like that, I, I send it, uh, I send them over to him. Um, but, and even like some of the more prominent NHL guys, I talked to like five of them yesterday <clears throat> just to check in to say, Hey, how are things going, bud? Like, you know, winter's over, spring's coming. Uh, how you making out? And uh, and it, you know, it, it's it's as therapeutic for me as it is for them, I'm sure. And and uh, but very very lucky for people to, to have people in this world like Chuck to to run such a group. Um, and it really is. It's it's all guys. It can be anybody. Like it can be anybody that that needs to chat. But kind of the 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 makeup, the genetic makeup of the group are the are the guys that did our job. And and uh, it's really, you know, it's funny. I had one guy come on and he's like, Teddy, how can you be a nurse? Like, remember you did this, this, and this, and we did this to the, to the other team. And he goes, how are you a nurse now? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm a nurse and I like it. Um, and so we joke about it. And, it, and <clears throat> the thing about the, uh, about the, um, that, that group is like, I don't, I can't talk hockey at my job. Um, uh, you know, the last thing I want is a is a family member of somebody to say, oh, you were a hockey player? Let me look you up and then just see a lot of videos of me not scoring goals and then say, oh, geez, I don't know if I want to trust the, you know, my folks with, with you guys. But so I did do a pretty deep scrub of the Internet to try to get as many of those videos out as I could. But there were there's a few that were that remain. Um, but it really uh, it's very therapeutic to sit there and because they'll either think you're insane or that you're lying when you tell the stories. But when you're on that <laughs> Wednesday, too, um, no matter what you did, you're not the craziest one. And you're not even in the top 10. Like everybody has these other top 10 uh, link gate stories or some of these other knuckleheads that um, <clears throat> that did their things that were crazy, crazy stories. You know, mine are, mine are boring. Uh, I still think of them fondly. You know, I think of them very, very fondly. And I'll tell you, having been retired from the game for about 16 years now, it's amazing how much better of a hockey player I've gotten uh, as I tell my stories. <laughs> of course. That's exactly how it always would work, right? Yeah. Just all that yep. time when yep. you're like, you know, when you were waiting, when you were waiting to get out there, and now you're probably, you know, you get the right amount of minutes for, you know what, you're skating again. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was really good, but, you know, <laughs> By 
now, now that I haven't played for 17 years, I was a really good hockey player. Um, and actually, I just I just talked to uh, uh, my my buddy uh, there, Jason Michelson, the goon, and I went down to Danbury for that ring of uh, ring of honor ceremony, and um, where uh, we were thinking about coming out and playing one game uh, this year. I'd love to play one game uh, just so my son could see what it was like. But uh, in reality, uh, I don't know, man, if I, if I fought a 22 year old French kid and I lost, uh, I don't know how, how my big fat head would, would take that. So. <laughs> it, it, it would be, um, a, it would be a good uh, memory though, for sure. Cause Dan Barry, I, I, and I don't know um, how much you dug into some of the guests I've had on here, but you know, I had Jason McCrimmon on here. I had Ryan Devine on here. Of course, I had Westy on here. I've had yep. Herm on here. So there's a, a definitely a, a, a Danbury connect there, for sure. Yep. Um, Teddy, it's it's so it's so funny, kind of going through the questions and stuff. You're, by the way, um, you you you've uh, you're definitely as as good as as Westy mentioned to me when um, he told me you got to talk to this guy, just because the thing yeah. I love about about our conversation is that here you are the fighter um here you are that guy but man you're so humble you're you're like ah well uh, you know <laughs> the, the names you've dropped just in the last <coughs> excuse me allergy season um <laughs> but um the names you dropped me in the last 40 minutes um pretty much just tells me um how connected you were to the, to the community how the thing is that I was trying to dig for was, you know, the fighter versus and the caregiver and what you just mentioned about your guys' Wednesday Wednesday chats and things like that. Maybe that's where the connect really comes through just because, like you said, you can talk about hockey with those guys. Um, but also I think, and I imagine from, from the caregiver experience you have, that probably helps you a lot um, how those conversations get constructed. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I, um, I was very, I, I have no business. I can't think of anyone that I've ever met that was a worse hockey player than I was, uh, to to get a paycheck. Um, but I don't know outside of maybe Terry O'Reilly. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else who loved the game more than I did. Um, to do whatever you could do to, you know, there, there's still a tremendous amount of pride when I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I still have. I don't know, seven or eight of my jerseys and I keep wanting to get them framed and put them in my, uh, either in my basement or my, as you can see from my office, there's tons of, uh, wall space. Uh, yeah. One of my there's, there's a spot right color. behind you ready. That's just ready. Yeah. yeah. And it's there's big a spot right behind like you that's just ready for them. So, yep. So that'll, there's enough space <laughs> to fit one of my giant jerseys. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it really, it, it's, a. Uh, I mean, it, it pales in comparison to um, when I had my kids and, and get married to my wife. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, all my cylinders are, are, are going, you know, we're, we're clicking on, on every gear now. But, um, you know, I, I do. I was very much looking forward to, to being able to do this podcast today because I don't get to talk hockey that much. And, and I truly love it. It was a it was a wonderful part of my life, which I've, I've very successfully left in my rearview mirror. With the exception of my guys, uh, you know, I give my cell phone out to anybody. And, and uh, I think I put a thing on Facebook the other day when, when uh, Chris Simon had passed saying, you know, I, it would be an honor if you if, if you're in a tough spot. I'd be honored if you at two in the morning call me, even if you're all banged up, uh, just call me and I'll, I'll talk to you. And, and if I need to, I'll jump on a plane and come out and see you. You know, it's. <clears throat> there's always, always, always tomorrow. And, and, uh, no matter how bad the chips are, you know, I've dealt with, you know, on the fire department, lots of, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had people that, that passed away from fires in houses. I've been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of fatal accidents, car accidents and heart attacks, medicals. And, um, you know, there's always tomorrow there's, there's, you, you know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about it and, they were, they were pretty, uh, and they were in a tough spot. <clears throat> I'm like, imagine following through and taking your life and not being able to see 
you know, uh, Brad Marchand get his thousandth goal or, you know, whatever, what, whatever tomorrow bring, not being able to listen to your kid bitch because the, the snow is, uh, is too thin to snowmobile or, um, right. my son is, my son is huge into hunting this year. Now I've never hunted before in my life, <clears throat> but a, a buddy of mine is, uh, Trevor Gillies and Gills was, uh, kind of telling me the ins and outs of, uh, of, of hunting and what to buy and Christ, I must've spent $15,000. And the only thing he shot was a damn partridge last year. You know, like it would have been cheaper to <laughs> fly out to Africa and, and catch a rhino than it was for, to buy all these guns and blinds and camouflage and scents and calls and all this scopes and bullets. See, you, um, you didn't know it. You didn't know it. Your kids, you said your kids weren't playing hockey. But they just found they just found a different hobby. It was just exp as expensive. Yeah, but I'll tell you, <clears throat> um, <laughs> my camp. I have a camp up in Jackman, which is about ten miles. Jackman, Maine, which is about ten miles from the Quebec border, which is forty miles from Quebec. I mean, from um, Saint George, a team that was in the LNAH with us. So um, it's it's amazing. Like I have a a bunch of land and a cabin and there's hundreds of deer around the cabin all the time. Once deer season came last year, there wasn't one. We didn't see one, but <clears throat> it's one of my all time favorite memories. I went up six weekends in a row with my 13 year old son and we sat out in the woods for eight hours a day, not talking. And, uh, it was, it was the time that I, it, it's probably my most revered memory with him. It's just sitting in the woods waiting for deer or partridge or bear or, moose or whatever to walk by to shoot and it never happened but uh we're gearing up now to not get any turkeys during turkey season so that's another five thousand <laughs> bucks i spent on turkey calls and youtube videos that i'm watching <laughs> on how to call these turkeys when i could just go to the grocery store for 50 bucks and get a huge turkey but uh i'm not going to do that well you know i mean you as well as i know those moments with your kids i mean i don't have kids but i I don't like fishing, but I love the moments I had fishing with my dad and yep. your son, even though he's, he's younger and you know, he's not going to, he's not going to say it was a big deal, but uh, when he's 30 and you're getting older and he thinks he'll think about those moments. And those, uh, those are crucial moments, I think in a father and son's <clears throat> um, life. Yeah. And so another cool thing about my job is we're a nonprofit, which is very rare in this industry. We're not a corporation. It's a standalone um, building. Uh, my boss is a huge family first person. So my daughter um, is a, you know, she made the varsity softball team this year for our town. I don't have to miss one of her games. I, I went to the game the other day. Um, it's just, it's, it's just, it's great to be able to go and, and be that proud dad up there. And I generally stand away from everybody because I can't stand sports parents. Um, uh, the, eventually I'll, I'll make enough friends where I'll, I'll sit with, uh, with one or two, but you know, I generally lean on the right field fence and, um, and watch the game and not listen to parents and not get involved in all the garbage that they like to talk about. Um, but, and that's you know, that's I, so I, smart. It's so smart that you do that. Um, one of my favorite parents that I you know I coach his son. He's also he plays though, and um, he has a, he does the same thing. I see him in the I see him up in the stands, and he'll have headphones on. He literally is just avoiding talking to the other parents and hearing you know the things that they say and and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I think that's such a great idea. Yeah. You do that. Just because it's toxic, some of these parents are toxic, and uh, it's it should never that be never that way. Played a sport, you know. These people have never played a sport. They were like second trumpet in their high school band, and now they think because their kids a, a whether they're a pee wee z or or uh, you know uh, they play travel ball. Um, you know, I'm, I'm our our family is big into baseball and softball, um, <clears throat> but they you know they never played a sport. Or they were, you know, in the band or whatever. I, I probably put people like that in lockers in high school, which I may or may not feel bad about. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, but they're the most outspoken ones that really they're, they're clueless what they're talking about. Um, yeah. And, yet, you know, yelling at an umpire or a referee. I mean, I hate 
I can play men's league hockey all day long, uh, pickup hockey all day long. And I'm not going to go in a corner. I'm not going to throw an elbow. As soon as there's a friggin' referee on the ice, I turn into an absolute jerk. And I realize that. And that's why I don't play hockey anymore. Even when I started doing men's leagues, uh, I very rarely made it to the handshake at the end of the game. And my, my suspensions would get longer and longer till I finally went to the rink guy. I'm like, listen, buddy, like, what would happen if I lost that fight? I happen to win because I'm good at it, but I didn't start it like this. Our goalie was Doug Flutie in our men's league. Doug Flutie was our goalie. And if somebody went near flute, I had to go over and ask him to not go near flute again. And right. if, they, if they weren't receptive to my, to my suggestion, then we'd have to talk about it further. <clears throat> and I would win those fights, obviously, because it's men's league and you're fighting against accountants and librarians. Right. And right. Um, but I remember I had a fight in, in my men's league where at the end of the game, um, it was like three or four seconds after the game, one of my guys, he was a I don't know, 45 year old guy. I was in my twenties at the time, probably <clears throat> he picked the puck up to hand to the ref. We had, it was a playoff game and we had lost. And this kid came out and cross checked the guy in the face. So I went over and I held the guy, had him by the neck and his feet were, I don't know, 18 inches off the ice. And I'm just, Every time I'd punch him, his head would go back and hit the glass and come back. And I'd punch him again. <clears throat> so I hear clunk, 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 clunk. And I look, and the goalie's coming down. So I throw this kid off. I grab the goalie, popped him. He fell. I fell on him. And everybody jumped on us. So I had my thumbs in his eyes, and I was holding his ears, and I'm whacking his head against the ice. <clears throat> so the referee breaks it up, and he's pulling back on my neck. And I'm like, all right, buddy, like, fight's over. You and he's going like that to me. He's like, you've always been a punk. You're a punk. <clears throat> I'm like, listen, champ, I can't touch you, so you can't touch me, so beat it. So he right. put his finger on my nose and went like that. So I grabbed him by the hair and just boom. <clears throat> and I broke, I broke his nose in his orbit. <clears throat> Turns out that that guy, that referee, was the father of the goalie and the other kid, who were, those two were brothers, and it was like the night before Thanksgiving. So the, the, the forward, the one that did the cross check, I fed him his lunch really, really hard. Um, that was a, that was a very angry fight. Um, and then the goalie, I was trying to pop his eyes out of his head. Um, but the, you know, it was just four knuckles right to the guy's nose at orbit. And so they must've had a great Thanksgiving, I'm sure. But <laughs> uh, I got thrown out of the league forever. And I went up to the league guy. I'm like, but this is what happened. Like Marty Willard is the greatest guy in the world. And, and he's not, he's never even gotten a penalty in men's league. He's a great player, but he's never even gotten a penalty. <clears throat> this happened. And then fortunately for me, the other referee backed me up and I only got a lifetime suspension for a couple of weeks there. So, uh, <laughs> but, I, but, but after that, I wound up, I, I am banned from that rink. I'm banned from most of the rinks around here, to be honest. Yeah. So, well, I'm kind of the same way. I mean, during COVID, um, once there were some restrictions where we could play a bit, um, those are actually some of the best skates I've ever had because there was no refs. We were just yeah. having fun. No one was hurt. No one was <laughs> yeah. trying to hurt anybody. We're just we're just we're just hanging yeah. out, scoring goals, having a few yeah. sodas after. Um, even though we were having a few sodas in like the roof of a of a rink because of course we couldn't be inside or anything like that. Right. But right. it was uh, it was still a good time. But yeah, the ref. A ref should never should never touch you that aggressively, and I'm glad you uh, took care of yourself in that situation. Well, I think he learned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Teddy, this has been such a great conversation, um, man. Having you have had one heck of a one heck of a lifetime, not only as a fighter, um, as a as a local board member, a caregiver, a neighbor. Um, you know, I know the thing that was interesting in the meet your neighbor interview, you're like, Oh, I'm not a, I'm not a hometown guy or I'm not a, you know, and it seems like you really, um, you really are as humble as, as where you grew up. Um, sounds like you had a pretty great life growing up. You've had a pretty great life as a father. Um, you had a great life as a fighter. Um, and I think everyone that you've connected yourself to, um, is happy to have known you in that situation. Um, nah, not one everybody. last question though, <laughs> <laughs> not that ref. I'm sure that ref right, probably right. doesn't want, want to hang out. Um, yep. uh, it'd be funny to bring him a, uh, like a Turkey dinner though. 
Uh, maybe maybe <laughs> as, as a reminder. Kind of straw to eat it with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, my last question with folks is usually, what are you looking for in the future? What do you got? Got anything else planned? Um, are you kind of settling in? What's uh, what's on the, what's on the on the docket for uh, for Teddy? Well, I'm 54, um, and I I have this discussion quite often when I have after I have a couple of beers at the local brewery. Uh, there's one particular person that I have discuss with this discussion with often. Um, if you equate me or us to dogs, <clears throat> I'm a Great Dane, <clears throat> uh, maybe closer to a St. Bernard, uh, but, you know, I'm not a Chihuahua. Chihuahuas live till you, till they're 150. <clears throat> you know, I'm on borrowed time. I've, <laughs> I've, I've had a good run. I don't have a single regret. I would love to watch my kids uh, go through life with big fat smiles on their faces. Uh, I'd love to, you know, same thing with my wife. Um, I'd love to watch them graduate. I'd love to watch them get married, maybe have some grandkids. But if I went tomorrow, I went tomorrow, buddy. And, and I don't have one single regret, uh, in, in, uh, in, in anything. Um, uh, but <clears throat> you know, being, doing what I, what I've done in my life, I've always had somewhat of an addictive personality. Uh, and right now my, uh, my sole focus is on, uh, the happiness of my, my wife and kids. And that's all I care about, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm definitely back burner to these guys, but everything they do makes me proud, whether it's my kid, you know, building the stupid jump with his bicycle and wiping out and I have to fix his handlebars again, or my daughter the other day it, bases were loaded and she was a pinch runner on first base. She has, uh, she does not have my speed. Uh, she is excessively faster than I. Um, so the girl hit a double and Ella had to stop, uh, as she came around third because she caught the person from second, uh, you know, and, and everybody had a big laugh over that, but everything they do makes me happy and, and proud. And my son's going to the high school that I went to that, that, uh, the tech school in Framingham where my jersey's retired. Uh, I've been on the school committee there for about nine years. Uh, you know, my wife has a, a great job and, you know, when, when we're at the, at the fields watching either baseball or softball or at the courts watching basketball, it's just nice to see the big smile that she has on her face watching them because she's got a lot of pride. It's the same stuff. Like we are, we definitely align with our, with our thoughts and values. And, um, so my next, uh, you know, all I'm looking forward to is, is, uh, you know, I'll work here for another eight years. When I'm 62, I'll, I'll go out. Um, and uh, that's it. <laughs> well, that's uh, sounds like a pretty good plan. Um, so, sounds like you need a nice, a nice rocking chair in the situation as well. Uh, they gave me one <laughs> when I retired from the, from the board of selectmen. <laughs> it's got my name and the town seal on it. It's awesome. There you go. Wow. That's uh <clears throat> and it came, it's that's... funny. It came with a stopwatch. Uh, zip tie, zip tape to it, because when I ran, when I was the chair of the board, um, we had this thing called public comment, and you come up and you get two minutes, and I wouldn't let people go over one second. Uh, so at two minutes, I always had my phone out. I'm like, all right, two minutes, and you're done. Moving on, next, done. And then same thing with our agenda items. So I was able to run a very, uh, I ran a kind of a military style meeting where, okay, you have 15 minutes, you got 15 minutes, and I don't care if you're the board of health that wants to come up and tell me how awful. COVID is, which by the way, I don't care about your opinion because you don't know what you're talking about. You're not a nurse, you check septic systems. Uh, but the townspeople <laughs> get furious. They're like, this guy's giving us a, an update on COVID. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I do, Let, ask me a question. I'll tell you yeah. the answer on COVID. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. it's funny. So that stopwatch is still on the rocking chair. Those, uh, it was pretty funny to find those on YouTube. Cause you guys had, if, if you go on, on YouTube, um, put the town in and things like that, that those show up because it sounds yeah. like you guys had to do, obviously like everybody at, at a certain point, you guys had to do kind of zoom calls or something for right. your, for your meetings. Yep. So it was, uh, yeah, you were, you, you had it under control for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, so like I said, my wife, she's an attorney. She's the lead attorney in the state for uh department of children and families. Um, I have to argue with her 
and and give pros and cons of why I'm having Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts because it's 40 cents more. So I'm well versed in arguing and I don't win <laughs> very many at home. I'm going to be frightfully honest with you. Uh, so I, when I worked at the prison, that was a, a, a great experience for me because I never lost a fight or an argument with somebody in handcuffs. So uh, that that was a morale booster for me. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm I, I do miss doing that selectman stuff. That was pretty fun. But the, the political culture in our town in the country is just it's a volunteer job. And, and I know that my mom's yeah. going to get if my wife has aspirations to progress her career, whether it be a judge or whatever she wants to do. Um, I don't want my knuckleheaded comments to hold her back on a you know for me having a volunteer job. Right. But, uh, but she, but she does need to, we do need to get these jerseys up behind you. Um, Teddy, yeah. again, it's been a great conversation with you. Um, I can't wait, um, for the rest of the, I can't, I can't wait for the rest of the cross ice pass community to hear, um, these great stories and, um, we will talk soon and hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to, to share a soda and, uh, and get Westy around with us. Yeah, it'd be fun to be on with Weston. And uh, hey, I was honored to to be asked. You know, I've I've left hockey in my rearview mirror 15 years ago. It's nice to to be asked to come on this. I really appreciate it. And if there's, uh, you know, you have my cell phone number. If there's anything, I still have a list of of, uh, of guys uh, that would be that they make certainly some very interesting uh, interviews. So if and if there's. Uh, <clears throat> You know, you have my cell phone number. If there's anything, I still have a list of of, uh, of guys uh, that would be that they make certainly some very interesting uh, interviews. So if there's any guys yeah. that I can turn to, any, uh, I will. Uh, I'll definitely take advantage of that. I really appreciate that. Um, thanks so much, Teddy. Thanks. Steve. Well, what a great chat with Teddy. Um, he's truly a great icon for how people think of hockey players or how people should think of hockey players. Um, because he will protect you in any way he can while doing it in the nicest way he can. He is such a nice dude, um, such a strong person, um, loves loved talking to us about his kids, his family, his career um, as a hockey player, and what he does now um, in medicine. So this was a... This was kind of a, a, a surprise on my part because um, a friend said, you got to talk to this guy. And I'm like, ah, and we've been, we've been having cross ice pass has been blessed with having some of these really great um, people that not everyone knows, um, but to have great stories and great things to talk about. So um, keep that in mind because I try to make it a little more surprising than most. Um, but there are, of course, there's some big names down the road coming as well as uh some people you might never have heard of that might have some pretty great stories that you be that you're interested in listening to um i wanted again to add the new track um on forced penalties from um our guest from episode 25 the zambonis um i feel like it's worth doing it it's a great it's a great track they're a great band um talking hockey speaking speaking the hockey language um via music um, and I hope it can get people um, into buying tickets uh, to their show May 26th at the Bowery Electric with Dave Hill. Um, don't forget, folks, subscribe, comment, let me know what you're thinking. Um, and uh, that's about it. Um, off to episode 27, which will be the last week of the NHL season. Crazy to think. Um, here we are already. All right, guys. Everyone have a wonder. Everyone put your taxes in. Um, everyone have a wonderful week. And we will talk very soon. Much better.